we left the S4 on a bit of a cliffhanger. The past few episodes, we've been hunting down a battery drain, and it's honestly been pretty elusive. At the very end of the last episode, I mentioned that we were gonna get the car scanned, in the hopes that maybe that would point us in the right direction. Well, we did that, and turns out it was something that came completely out of left field. Today, we're solving the mystery of the S4's battery drain. Quick recap time. If you missed the last few episodes, we've been trying to find a battery drain. That much should be obvious. What have we done to narrow it down though? We followed a process of elimination. First, we eliminated the possibility of the alternator or the battery, and then things got a bit more specific. We busted out the multimeter and ran a current draw test on the car. It took a while, but we eventually narrowed down the draw to fuse 15. And according to the fuse panel, that fuse is responsible solely for the air conditioning system and the instrument cluster. As it turns out, each one of those small systems has quite a few parts to it. From here, we unplugged the instrument panel, trying to look for a change. Since that draw didn't change, we assumed that the instrument panel was not at fault. So we jumped over to diagnosing the AC fan. We eventually went through every single harness related to the air conditioning system, and there was no change in the draw whatsoever. And to make matters just even more confusing, we were running into some after-run fan issues. The after-run fan system is a system designed to turn the fans on after you shut the car off to help it cool down more gradually. My fans were coming on, but they were coming on at max speed, and the only way I could get them to shut off was by unplugging the battery or waiting until it died. This only happened on days where it snowed quite a bit, which simply added to the confusion. There were a lot of suspects in this mystery. These were complicated circuits, and there's honestly a few systems that could be at fault. So I thought the best idea was to get the car professionally scanned. Professional scanners are able to read the different computers of the car and check for internal faults. By professional scan, I mean something more than my cheap OBD2 scanner. I figured maybe there was something that a simple current draw test wouldn't be able to specifically find, and I was hoping to save myself more time going down the rabbit hole. Boy, was that a good idea. And man, I am so glad that I had this done, because as you can see, this car no longer has a battery drain. At this point, that's great news, but it leaves us with one really critical question. One of the running themes of the last two episodes was the idea of a rabbit hole. Rabbit hole, spider's web, either way, the idea is this. This is an over-engineered car. Over-engineering is great because of redundancy. But the downside is when you're trying to find something really specific that's wrong with it, sometimes you can be looking in entirely the wrong place. When the car was scanned, it immediately pointed us to an internal fault in one of the car's computers. And here's where it gets just a bit interesting. It had absolutely nothing to do with the AC, nor with the gauges behind the steering wheel. We were looking in the wrong place, literally and figuratively. Deep in the trunk, behind this tiny panel, lies this car's OEM navigation computer. This computer had an internal fault which was causing a battery drain. Now your first reaction may have been just a bit like mine. Was the current draw test we did wrong? No, in fact. This internal fault causes an issue on the Fuse 15 circuit. I'll explain that in more detail in just a second. As a temporary and free fix though, I can just unplug this computer. It's not a perfect or a forever solution, but this is an uncommon problem and an uncommon part. With this navigation unplugged, the car no longer dies, so that is definitely the culprit. Someday maybe we'll fix it, but finding a used one is a bit expensive, so unplugging it for now is a really good compromise. I'm just glad that it's finally gone. This is kind of a unique system in this car, and there's really not a lot of information about it online. My car is a 2000, so it was likely manufactured in 1999, and it came with OEM navigation. From an engineering standpoint, that's really cool considering the only screen on this car is this little pixel display in the instrument cluster. 
Notice the emphasis on instrument cluster. Our instrument cluster works just fine, well, other than the pixelated display, but that's beside the point. The instrument cluster itself does not have a drain. It does, however, rely on very specific computer systems to tell it what to display. And one of those happens to be the navigation computer, which is why something in the trunk is part of this instrument panel circuit. And it also explains why the drain didn't go away when we unplugged the instrument cluster. And that's what led us to believe that the instrument cluster wasn't at fault at all. Also, huge shout out to every single one of you who sent me wiring diagrams for this car. They were super helpful in figuring out how everything was connected. At first, they're a little confusing to read. The large blue box on the left is our instrument cluster, and all of these lines represent different wires to various systems. And these other small blue boxes are various components or computers in the car. That's an oversimplification, but it gets the idea across. As you can see here, the navigation computer is one of the boxes which eventually connects to the instrument cluster, explaining why it's part of this circuit and fuel 15 to begin with. Whew, that was a frustrating issue. What made it even harder to diagnose was the fact that none of these subsystems that are part of the instrument panel circuit were even listed on the fuse panel guide. So unless you had access to the wiring diagrams, finding something like this is not exactly a simple job. What's my biggest takeaway then? My biggest takeaway is that I'm glad I didn't scan the car right away. That sounds a little backwards because that would have fixed the issue right away, but hear me out. I think going down the rabbit hole for complicated systems like this is honestly the best way to learn about the car. Had we not went through all the diagnostic processes that we did, we would have learned a lot less about the car overall. I feel a lot more comfortable with how these electrical systems connect, and now I have access to a bunch of wiring diagrams I never would have seen had we just scanned the car in the beginning. Plus, even though it was time consuming, I think it was an enjoyable process. We did narrow down the problem properly which is also fulfilling. Now that doesn't mean that the next time we run into an electrical issue, I'm not gonna scan the car. I'm just saying there's value in work like this. I'll definitely be looking to pick up one of the fancy scanners. So at the end of the day, I am just grateful that the car is back in action and I'm super stoked for what I have planned. My apologies that this episode is a little bit shorter than normal, but there's a good reason for that. You see, the S4 is currently completely torn apart and what I was working on took pretty much the entire weekend. I've got a fun and longer episode I'm working on for next week, which I think you guys will really enjoy. I'll include a teaser at the end, but I think it's something this car has been needing for a very, very long time, and I'm excited to do it justice. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, consider dropping a like and subscribing for more. It's the best way you can help support me and my content. Either way, I'll see you guys next week with the next episode. Thank you again. Have a wonderful day.